Hey all, today we are going to discuss about fibrous dysplasia. It is a bone and joint disease as we know that. This is basically an uncommon non-hereditary developmental anomaly. As the name suggests, it is fibrous dysplasia. So the bone is replaced by fibrous tissue in this disease and therefore secondary metaplastic bone formation occurs. The cause of this disease is basically unknown, but recent studies shows that there is a post-zygotic somatic mutation in gene GNAS1. This gene occurs or it is present on chromosome 20q13.2. So the gene GNAS1 basically encodes for G protein. So whenever this uh, gene is mutated there is continuous activation of G protein which has a direct impact on cyclic AMP. So the overproduction of cyclic AMP occurs in this disease. So basically what happens this cyclic AMP has three roles three basic roles that has been discussed here that is endocrine organs it has an impact on melanocytes and also on osteoblasts so when there um, when there is overproduction of cyclic amp then hyperfunction of endocrine organs takes place which causes precocious puberty also hyperthyroidism cortisol overproduction is also seen Secondly, hyperproliferation of melanocytes occurs. Melanocytes are pigment producing cells in our body. So therefore, a typical type of spots that is caffeolate spots are seen in this disease. Thirdly, there, there is an impact on osteoblast. So these osteoblasts show shows defective differentiation and hence the disease fibrous dysplasia and one thing more that is due to continuous activation of g protein it also affect wnt or B beta catenin signaling pathway which is involved in bone modulation so basically it affects the bone modulation process now we are going to discuss about the clinical features of uh, fibrous dysplasia based on the severity of the disease and tissues involved it has been divided into two that is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia and monoostotic fibrous dysplasia. The terms itself tells that in polyostotic few to more most of the bones are involved but in monoostotic only one or single bone is involved right. The polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is obviously more severe and monoostotic fibrous dysplasia is less severe as only single bone is involved. The polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is less common whereas monoostotic fibrous dysplasia is more common. More common. So therefore polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is less common but more severe whereas in monoostotic fibrous dysplasia it is more common and less severe. Now we will talk about uh, the sites of involvement in polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. So uh, here femur, tibia, pelvis, ribs, skull, facial bones, upper extremities, lumbar spine, clavicle, cervical spine, these all bones are involved in, this, in decreasing order of their frequency. In decreasing order 
Similarly, in uh, monoostotic fibrous dysplasia, the sites of involvement are ribs, femur, tibia, craniofacial bones, and humerus. These are also in decreasing order. In polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, the signs and symptoms are such as bone pain, spontaneous fractures, going of long bones. So as the bone is very fragile and uh, it can't bear weight, so there occurs bowing of long bones. Also there is curvature of femoral neck and proximal shaft which leads to Schaeffert crook deformity. This is basically a pathognomic feature of fibrous dysplasia, right? Pathognomic means that this feature is only seen in or this deformity is only seen in this kind of disease only, right? Now the monoostotic fibrous dysplasia. Though in fibrous dysplasia there occurs no gender predilection in males and females there is equal there is equal chance of getting this disease there is no no racial predilection but there is an exception or mild predominance in females in monoostotic fibrous dysplasia this monoostotic fibrous dysplasia is more common in children and young adults. When monoostotic fibrous dysplasia is associated with maxilla or the maxilla maxillary bone is involved, then it gives a basic leonin appearance and this is also known as or it has been called as Leon, Leontius Oshia. Now the associated syndromes with PFT that is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. The number one is McCune Albright syndrome which is basically a triad. Secondly the Jeffries type and thirdly the Mesobrot syndrome. Firstly, McCune Albright syndrome is basically a triad. Triad of PFT that is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia and endocrine abnormalities and thirdly the cafeolate spots. So basically when PFT is associated with endocrine abnormalities plus cafeolate spots then this kind of disease is known as McCune Albright syndrome. Right. Secondly, the Jeffreys type. When PFT is associated with cafeolate spots, then we call it as Jeffreys type. Thirdly, the Mesobrod syndrome. It is um, this syndrome is having two diseases, that is multiple inter intramuscular myxomas and PFT. Now the oral manifestations. Whenever the maxilla or mandible is involved, it causes pain, swelling and deformity of the affected bone. As maxilla or mandible is affected, it will cause typical malocclusions. So typical malocclusion is seen. Malocclusions. So the first clinical sign of uh, these uh, jaws involvement are painless swelling or bulging of the jaw. The canine fossa is also involved as the uh, zygomatic bones are also involved in these kind of fibrous dysplasia. Whenever maxilla or mandible is involved, it is very invasive kind of. Basically, the fibrous dysplasia of maxilla is a serious form of disease which occurs only in children, most prominently it occurs in children, right? It is difficult to eradicate as it is locally invasive kind of 
fibrous dysplasia it will involve all the uh, zygomatic bones all the facial bones are basically involved which will cause facial deformity in this kind of facial deformity in this kind of fibrous dysplasia basically when maxilla is involved this lesion is not uh, well circumscribed that's why we call it as it extend locally locally invasive kind of fibrous dysplasia right now the radiographic features of fibrous dysplasia as we know that all the bone is replaced by fibrous tissue so the bone is not that dense enough bone is not dense therefore radiolucent lesions are seen in radiographs all the normal trabecular pattern which is present in normal bone is completely lost in fibrous dysplasia endoosteal uh, portions show scalloping so scalloping of bones is seen thirdly the lucent lesion is surrounded by a sclerotic border a thick sclerotic border which therefore gives a typical sign that is ringed sign in the radiographs ring sign now the early lesion is basically radiolucent it may be unilocular or multilocular but after some time then uh, when the lesion is advanced or mature then these radio opaque um radiolucent lesion is covered with radio opaque spicules in between due to new bone formation in between these lesion therefore it will give a typical ground glass appearance or a orange peel appearance in the radiographs we will see in mature kind of lesions thirdly a typical feature or characteristic finding in craniofacial fibrous dysplasia is radiographic thickening of the skull bases is seen in radiographs whenever craniofacial bones is affected now the histological features here also we will see trabeculae in the woven bone so a typical c shaped trabeculae are seen in the histological features or histo slides when the uh, lesion is early or immature then fibrous tissue is seen after some time when the lesion gets advanced then trabeculae are seen in the lesion which therefore in the advanced lesions bony trabeculae are seen which gives a typical chinese letter pattern which is seen in fibrous dysplasia a chinese letter pattern is seen because of these c shaped trabeculae the intervening fibrous connective tissue shows mononuclear cells which resembles our osteoblasts right so these uh, mononuclear cells are also seen in between these fibrous tissues now the treatment of fibrous dysplasia there is no specific treatment exists for fibrous dysplasia since the disease is self limiting it ceases to grow once the patient reaches puberty therefore the disease is self limiting right the treatment for monoosteotic fibrous dysplasia is cosmetic surgery only whenever the uh, bones such as facial bones are or jaw bones are involved then there is facial deformity which which is which can be only be treated by cosmetic surgery only there is high risk or chances of optic canal compression therefore optic canal decompression is also required in such kind of treatment process vitamin d and bisphosphonate therapy is also beneficial because it is useful or useful in relieving bone pain and reducing the osteoclastic activity right so uh, vitamin d supplements are and bisphosphonate supplements are required now the treatment of polyosteotic fibrous dysplasia 
there is a multidisciplinary approach as number of bones are involved therefore we require um, a supervision on many bones at a time so we have to treat all the bone defects plus endocrinal dysfunctions should also be treated well now the radiotherapy in such kind of diseases is not required and not a uh, treatment of choice as uh, fibrous dysplasia has an high risk of developing radiation induced sarcoma such as osteosarcomas chondrosarcomas fibrosarcomas and many malignant forms